Next, please welcome retired Admiral James Sandy Winnefeld, former vice chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Here with the Atlantic's Ross Anderson. Admiral, uh, it's an honor to have you with us today. Um, we've asked you here to do a very difficult thing, which is to tell the story of how you lost your son, Jonathan, who we'll, we'll see here momentarily, um, to the opioid epidemic. Um, and in talking about the opioid epidemic over the last year, I've found myself telling your story frequently uh, because it's a powerful illustration of how this can happen to anybody's family. Um, if it can happen to um, an admiral's family, uh, someone who was the vice chair of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, it can happen to anyone. Um, and that goes to Jonathan, too, um, who I understand was quite a sweet kid. So why don't we start there? Can you tell us a little bit about Jonathan and what made him special? Sure, Ross. Uh, Jonathan was uh, an amazing young man. He grew up as the younger son of two in a military family. Mm -hmm. Moved around quite a lot. Uh, at one point, he was in five different school districts in six years. Mm -hmm. You can imagine what it's like to go into that brand new lunch room almost every year and the stress that that uh, imposes on a young man. He was quiet. He was kind. He was smart. Mm -hmm. He was a very good athlete, a very good baseball pitcher, and he loved doing that. He was also quite clever. Uh, as we've related, uh, there was one point in second grade uh, about two weeks after I had described to him what compound interest is, mm -hmm. that we got a phone call from his second grade teacher saying, did you all know that Jonathan is not only selling school supplies mm -hmm. <laughs> to his, his peers, but he's actually lending them the money and charging them the interest uh, <laughs> to do it. And I didn't know whether to be upset or proud. Um, yeah. But at one point, uh, one of the, the teachers joked that we have to be careful because Jonathan's going to want to be refinancing our home loans. <laughs> but he really was a smart and clever kid, um, but it, he was also suffering uh, all along. Yeah. And was there, um, you know, my wife and I talk a lot about how, and our kids are very young, about uh, how sort of blinded we are um, to our kids' weakness. You know, we sort of see them through the distortion of our uh, immense affection for them. And so was it... Do you recall a moment, you know, in, in his early teens or at some point in his adolescence where uh, you could see that he was struggling with some kind of mental health issues or with uh, substance abuse? Well, we gradually came to understand as Jonathan grew up that he was suffering from anxiety and depression. Whether it's genetics or environment or whatever, it, it just became apparent to us that he was quiet, withdrawn, and that there was something going on there. And uh, eventually we took him, uh, because his teachers would say, you know, John is not participating very much in class, even though he's a very smart kid. Mm -hmm. uh, we think maybe you ought to have him checked out. And we took, took him in, and we kept getting this diagnosis of ADD, mm -hmm. uh, attention deficit syndrome. And, and we didn't really believe that. We thought it might be something else like anxiety or depression. And, and eventually we sort of gave in to that diagnosis, and he was prescribed Adderall, mm -hmm. which is probably the worst thing you can give to somebody who has anxiety or depression. And eventually we started to, to sense that a little liquor was disappearing. My wife, Mary, would uh, confront John with that, and he was quite open. And he said, you know, I, I need something at night to come down off of the Adderall. Mm -hmm. And one thing led to another. Um, Self-medication is one of the three pathways of, of getting into uh, uh, substance use disorder, and Jonathan was on that pathway. And eventually it led to harder and harder drugs and, and more and more drugs. He was not a party kid, uh, but he was definitely self-medicating. Um, I know that through your nonprofit work in the last year, you've had a case, I mean, just from talking to you, you're sort of a fountain of information about this epidemic. Um, but take me back then when you were first trying to get uh, substance abuse care for your son and treatment. Uh, what did you find, despite being a very a, a, a powerful, well-connected person in this world, what did you find when you saw how our country is set up to deal with this problem? Was it easy to find care? Was it affordable? <clears throat> Well, we've learned an awful lot about this whole system since we lost our son. So I'm speaking with the benefit of 2020 hindsight. Yeah. But back in, in early 2016, when we were really trying to get Jonathan into counseling, which we did, uh, and to seeing a psychiatrist, which we did, and that seemed to help a little bit. But we were also trying to get him into intensive outpatient treatment in Northern Virginia, and there just wasn't any space. Mm -hmm. He was on a, uh, a waiting list. 
he had a couple of precipitating events. He lost a girlfriend who was going to be the first person in her college or in her family ever to go to college and did not want to be encumbered by a young man who was going through these problems. And then his grades suffered, uh, and he was not able to be on his baseball team his senior year. So he was spiraling downward in the spring of his senior year. And we really were trying to get him into some kind of intensive uh, treatment. And before that could happen, he had a precipitating event where he tried to take his own life. He failed uh, and ended up uh, hitting a, a telephone pole in his car at a relatively slow rate of speed and uh, bat did not badly injure himself at all. But we realized at that point that we could not keep our son safe and we, he needed to go into inpatient treatment. And how did he do inpatient, in, inpatient treatment? I know that one of the really excruciating, uh, I know from personal experience that one of the most excruciating things in dealing with uh, a loved one who's struggling with addiction is, is the sort of swings of false hope and the, the times when they, you know, they seem to be coming out of it. Did Jonathan have a period like that? Well, you know, it was interesting because um, when we first took him into basically a psych ward to detox, he told yeah. us this was the worst mistake we would ever make. And that's just classical for somebody who's in this situation who is in complete denial that they have a problem. And then it took us five days of intensive work just to find a place that could take him, which was very complex because John was close to his 18th birthday. Mm -hmm. So adult places wouldn't take him. Yeah. Uh, places that only take adolescents wouldn't take him because he was almost an adult. So you we, you know, we were very fortunate after five or six days to find a place. When John got into treatment, to more directly answer your question, he really did well. Over time, you know, that first month is rough, detox, denial, I don't want to be here, this is yeah. boring. Uh, and they, they tell parents, you know, don't respond to that. Just, well, you know, John, this is, we'll make, please tell your counselors and, and uh, you know, we're here for you, that kind of thing, rather than trying to do something about that. Over the course of 15 months of treatment, and I would say even after about a year, we saw our son coming back. Mm -hmm. It takes that long for the brain to recover from the physiological, physical changes that have taken place inside your brain. It takes lo that long for the brain to recover. And we saw his ambition come back. We saw his zest for life. We were able to have a conversation with him. It was really neat to see. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> you know, I got to know you a little bit in the weeks after Jonathan passed last November. And uh, I was going through our uh, co initial correspondence um, a couple days ago in preparation for this. And I was just struck that right from the beginning, uh, you had this kind of strength and, and sense of purpose and mission that uh, you know uh, was frankly inspiring to me, and I know some of that is is drawn from your you know a lifetime's worth of leadership experience, but uh, was some of that also drawn from from Jonathan and who he was? So there, uh, it's a really good question. Uh, Jonathan, as part of his emergence from treatment, mm -hmm. decided to go to the University of Denver. Uh, he had taken a gap year, and mm -hmm. Denver requires that you write an uh, essay as an incoming freshman. Now, Jonathan had gotten his emergency medical technician qualification while he was in treatment. He was very proud of that. It was a yeah. really cool thing, his EMT qual. And so the, the question posed in this essay was, well, who has had the most profound impact on your life? And of mm -hmm. course, any parent would want to think, well, of course, it's me. <laughs> but he wrote this amazingly powerful, well-written essay that was about an ambulance ride that he took while he was in his EMT qualification, where he found himself in the bathroom of a McDonald's in New Haven, Connecticut, administering CPR to somebody undergoing a heroin overdose. Mm. And he describes how at that moment, he decided that he was gonna dedicate his life to helping people who could not help themselves. And imagine his parents reading these things. Wow, touchdown, this kid is there. Yeah. Three weeks later, he was dead. Um, and so, in the wake of his loss, we had a choice. We could crawl up into a, a ball of anger, shame, and grief, which we did plenty of times, yeah. and which we do not begrudge anybody who mm -hmm. has such a loss for any reason uh, um, doing that. But we also decided that having 37 years of military experience, maybe knowing how to get a few things done, having a good, powerful network of friends in the business world since I retired, that we would feel terrible if we did not stand up and try to help the rest of this large community of people who are trying to reverse this epidemic if we didn't try to do our part. Uh, and so that's, yeah. Yeah. so the whole goal, all of this effort will be worth it if we, if we can prevent one more family from experiencing this terrible loss. Well, tell me about the nonprofit uh, you started. I, uh, it, it's called SAFE, um, and give us a, I know it's, it's sort of amazingly uh, comprehensive in its approach to the opioid epidemic, so give us well, a sense for it. Well, it's named SAFE after Stop the Addiction Fatality Epidemic. 
we decided uh, shortly after we lost John, when people were sending us emails offering flowers, uh, is there a place we can donate? Um, we decided to start our own nonprofit, which is its own challenge, and we were very blessed to be under the fiscal sponsorship of another fine organization that helped us get started. Mm -hmm. And we decided to be a national organization. We decided that we would structure ourselves after what we think the nation needs to do in order to reverse this epidemic. And there were really sort of six lines of operation. Uh, public awareness so that we can get the public behind the immense effort that's going to be required to, to resolve this and to do the most important thing, which is lower stigma associated with addiction. The second one was prevention, which is about credible voices talking to the most vulnerable audiences, such as in high schools. Uh, prescription medicine, which ranges everything from holding pharmaceutical companies responsible to uh, encouraging doctors and dentists to, to be more responsible in their prescription practices, to educating people who use opioids for pain medication to do it carefully yeah. and to dispose of it when they're done, that whole thing. Another was law enforcement and medical response, which is everything from let's take out the dealers, not the users, mm -hmm. uh, to let's make sure everybody's equipped with Narcan, naloxone, the life-saving drug uh, naloxone, and warm handoff so that when somebody goes into an emergency room, we do more than just treat them and street them back out. We actually try to get them into some kind of medication-assisted treatment. The next line is, is treatment itself. There's nowhere near enough capacity in this country. 20% mm. of the people in this country who need treatment are getting it, and there are a lot of reasons for that. We don't have enough of it. It's not affordable. There's a lot we can do in that regard, and we have a couple of really interesting projects in that area. And the last one is family outreach and support, and that's about if I only knew then what I know now, yeah. we would still have our son. So on our website, which is safeproject.us, we have a section there that's very important to us, which is lessons learned. Uh, we crowdsource those. We, we, anybody who has a lesson learned, we don't have a monopoly on that you know, in this epidemic. Yeah. All the way from when kids are in elementary school to all along this journey to emerging from treatment, there are a host of lessons learned that we wish we had and we want to share with other people. So that's kind of how it's laid out. Yeah. We, we put that along two major lines, safe campuses, because we want to see more campuses, which is where we lost Jonathan, step up yeah. to this program. And we're very grateful at University of Denver, which is where we lost Jonathan, has done that. They've stepped up. And also safe communities, getting the stakeholders together, gathering all the best practices we can from across the country and empowering communities to try to take this on themselves. Let's talk a little bit about lessons learned. Um, you've been at this a year now. What, what has surprised you the most as you've sort of taken in the kind of the scope of this epidemic and how it affects individual families? Well, there are, there are a whole host of surprises. One of the, the biggest surprises for me is how little we knew hmm. when Jonathan was going through this about the true science of addiction, the true science of, of treatment and recovery. We just didn't understand it. Another thing that, that really got us was, uh, and I'm not against HIPAA, but because Jonathan mm -hmm. turned 18 just as he was entering treatment, we did not have full awareness of, of what drugs he had been using. We thought he was addicted to marijuana, alcohol, and benzodiazepines. We didn't know there was an opioid problem. It would have been nice to know that at his age. It might have had us act differently when he came out of treatment. But across the country, I'm, I'm, I, there's just a whole host. I'll give you one, one example of a surprise is, is going into a community mm -hmm which is actually rare, but seeing law enforcement people reaching out to the harm reduction community and, mm -hmm. and those two meat eaters and leaf eaters, mm -hmm. seeing this problem through each other's eyes. Yeah. And when that happens, just the most amazing things can occur in a community to try to help reverse the epidemic. Whole host of surprises. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Admiral, uh, famously, uh, on the morning of 9-11, uh, you were the commanding officer of the USS Enterprise, and I, I believe you were somewhere near South Africa and uh, made the decision to uh, take the carrier into uh, the Arabian Gulf, uh, where it, it played, as I understand it, quite an important role uh, early on in the war on terror. And uh, I think we've, we've gotten into trouble in applying um, sort of metaphors of war uh, when it comes to drug problems. But I'd ask you, who's sort of moving the carrier right now uh, in the policy world? There really are sort of four layers of this thing. There's the federal government, there's uh, state government, local communities, and the nonprofit world. And I, there's good work going on in each place. Uh, there's, I think more work needs to happen at the federal level. Uh, mm -hmm. There are some Good members of Congress, Congressman Walden from Oregon, has really led the charge in the House to try to get a whole host of legislative items through and a little bit more funding. 
but, but we need much more support at the federal level, particularly financially, for the states. Uh, state governors are, uh, particularly the ones in the states that are most affected, um, are understanding this, they're feeling political pressure, they're doing the right thing, and they're doing as much as they can inside their states to help go after it. But this gets solved at the community level. Uh, it, it involves uh, the uh, government community, education, law enforcement, first responders, fire departments, civic groups, faith-based groups, business groups, the recovery community, uh, the treatment community, youth athletics, I mean, you name it, everybody's got a stake in this. And when you rally all those people together in a community, it's amazing what you can get done uh, if you can leverage some of the best practices that are out there. So, uh, and then there are a lot of really good nonprofits out there. We took an early philosophy that this is not a competition. The two worst things you can do to solve this epidemic are to get your, let your ego get attached to it mm -hmm. and to politicize it. And we decided that we will work with any of our fellow nonprofits out there, lift all boats if we can. Uh, and so it's, it really is a, a multi-dimensional effort to get this thing done. Admiral, uh, thanks for being with us today and thanks for sharing your story. My pleasure, thank you.